thank you, Father, for being, being that lamb. Coming to this earth, giving us the sacrifice that we need, Father, so that we can so that we can have that open line of communication, Father. Have that relationship with you, Father. We just thank you for it. And let us let us worship you today in the way that you deserve. house today. We've got a few folks that are out traveling. Keep them in your prayers if you would. Pray for their safety and uh, their return. And that the Lord would bless. You could have left that there, brother. I didn't just run it. So. <laughs> I'm kidding. Oh, my gosh. Sorry. All right. <laughs> so, anyway. 
want to remind you of a few things uh, uh, coming up here. Uh, today I want to talk to you about uh, increasing Christ in the new year. Uh, tonight, no evening service. We know folks have family in and things of that nature. But uh, uh, December 29th, uh, that's Wednesday, we're going to have a quick business meeting, 6 p.m., and have a time of prayer after that for our new year coming in. Happy New Year. It's here before you know it. I just figured out, finally, got to where I was signing my uh, checks. 2021. Now I've got to do all of that and get to 2022. But anyways, uh, that's coming up, folks. Uh, now, uh, also January 1st, Men's Fellowship Breakfast, 9 a.m. If you're able to come, we'd love for you to be there. And then 5 p.m. is the Ladies' Fellowship. Uh, yes, ma'am. We're moving it to the next Saturday because that next is Saturday. New Year's Day. Gotcha. Okay. So it'll be on the 8th. All right. Mm -hmm. Okay. On the 8th. Okay. Yeah. All right. Brother Robbie, still the first for the guys? I think do the first because, I mean, man, we need to come together and pray for the new year. Okay. Gotcha. No okay. better day to do it than on the first of the day. Gotcha. First day. Okay. Okay. So, guys, the first, ladies, the 8th. Okay. So, uh, February 4th through the 5th, Men's Beast Feast. If you would, uh, please, uh, guys, uh, if you're interested in going, sign up sheets out here. Cost is twenty dollars plus half the room uh, that we're going to stay in. You say, "Hey, I want to go to this, or I want to go to Friday night, or I want to go to Saturday night." That's you're more than welcome to do that. Uh, nothing, nothing keeping you from one or going to both of them, but uh, it'll both be a blessing. And so, if you have questions on that, let me know afterwards. I'll explain a little bit more later. Turn your Bible, to John chapter three, verse twenty-two through thirty. This is the message God has put on my heart uh, for today: increasing Christ in a new year. One thing we can honestly say is that we need more of Jesus in each and every aspect of our life. Amen? Amen. I'm going to read from a um, familiar passage, I'm sure, to you. In fact, you've heard me use this quote probably up until now quite often. Uh, and it is something that uh, we've shared a few different times. But uh, uh, we're going to read from John chapter 3, verse 22 this morning. And after these things came Jesus and his disciples into the land of Judea, and there he tarried with them and baptized. And John also was baptizing in Anon uh, near Salim, because there was much water there, and they came and were baptized. And John, for John was not yet cast into prison. And then there arose a question between some of John's disciples and the Jews about purifying. And they came unto John, and they said unto him, Rabbi, he that was with thee beyond Jordan, to whom thou bearest witness, behold, the same baptizeth, and all men come to him. John answered and said, A man can receive nothing except it be given him from heaven. You yourselves bear me witness that I said I am not the Christ, but I am him. I am uh, sent before him, rather. He that hath the bride is the bridegroom, but the friend of the bridegroom, which standeth and heareth him, rejoiceth greatly because of the bridegroom's voice. This, my joy, therefore, is fulfilled. He must increase but I must decrease. Let us pray, shall we? Heavenly Father, we thank you for the opportunity to be able to gather here today, Lord, and thank you for what yesterday represents. But Lord, I, I know, and uh, we all know this, Father, help us to be reminded of it, though, that, that, that Christmas is only part of the story. And God, that we look forward to Easter, and we look forward to everything in between, Father, of just simply living the resurrected life. Father, we thank you that your son did not stay that little baby in a manger, but willingly lived a perfect life and died a sacrificial death and rose victorious over the grave, Lord, for us, for all who would place their trust in him. God, we thank you for that precious gift. Now help us, Lord, as we get into your word and get ready to move into a new year, Lord, to look into our life honestly, uh, introspectively, Lord, just to consider uh, some of the areas, Lord, that, that uh, maybe we need to focus more on your son in our life through this new year. We love you, Father. We thank you. In Jesus' name we pray and ask. Amen. Amen. There's an old saying that nobody ever likes playing second fiddle. You probably have heard it, I'm sure, at some point in time, right? Uh, and the truth being told, that's, that's reality, right? Uh, it's sad to say, but it is. Uh, oftentimes it's hard to find folks who, who really want to uh, uh, necessarily go second. Uh, I'll give you a good example of this. Uh, kind of a loose example here. How many of you uh, have ever been in a car riding in the passenger seat 
but in your mind thinking, in fact, you're looking for that imaginary uh, brake pedal on the passenger <laughs> side, right? Uh, and, and if there were a, hand, uh, you know, a steering wheel there, boy, you'd sure grab a hold of that too, right? But in your mind, you're thinking, yeah. that person does not. <laughs> we don't need to point fingers. But <laughs> in your mind, you're thinking, that person does not need to be driving, right? <laughs> Maybe they're taking the corners a little fast, they're braking a little hard, or bright, not breaking hard enough. Amen? Now that we got everybody on the same page. <laughs> Brother, I do, I do uh, marriage counseling. Yeah? <laughs> gotcha. Gotcha. You know, it could be something as silly as that. It could be something uh, as, hey, I didn't get recognized. So and so did. You know, and why didn't they pick me? All these things. Uh, for example, I'll speak to a mission sending agency missionary, late missionary Robert Morrison of China said this as he spoke to him. He said, the great fault, I think, in our mission, in our mission is, not, is that no one likes to be second. He said, the world has yet to see what could happen if everyone lost the desire to get the glory. Wouldn't it be a marvelous place if nobody cared who got the credit? Wow. Powerful. You know, Lord Jesus referred to John the Baptist as the greatest man to be more born among women. Uh, and yet, even John realized that his ministry it was not about him. Uh, it, it wasn't about fluffing John's feathers. It wasn't about handing out tracts that had John's name on it or invitations and come to John's ministry out here at the, the riverside. I promise you, you'll be in for quite a treat. Uh, uh, any of that stuff, right? We the free locusts for everybody who would like some, right? <laughs> Anyways, you, you get the joke. You know where I'm going with that. Anyways, uh, John didn't do that, did he? It wasn't about pointing people to him. It wasn't about drawing a crowd to himself. It was about pointing people to Jesus Christ. And he knew that. He, he encapsulated every bit of that. That was the very reason for which God placed John on the face of this earth. To prepare the way for the Messiah. You see, back in the old days, when a king would enter into a town, he would send emissaries ahead of him. And those emissaries' job was to uh, make sure that those roads were good and straight and, and safe for the king. And, and they would gussy everything up and they would warn people, listen, you better be on your best behavior, right? You better come out dressed in your nines and all of this stuff uh, they would do. In fact, we still do that in a sense when the president's going to be in a town. They'll send a secret service ahead to make sure things are safe and so on and so forth. And they'll go further than that and, uh, as well, I'm sure. But, but this was the idea here. This was what John was brought into this earth for, was to prepare the way for the Messiah. Not necessarily to make sure the physical roads were safe and, and, and everybody had the roads had been graded for those that live on gravel roads. Uh, it wasn't that. He was making sure that the road to their heart was paved and ready and softened for the Messiah. That's exactly what he did. In fact, Luke 1, 14 through 17, we read about this. And this was the angel speaking to Zacharias, John's dad, before the birth of John. And thou shalt have joy and gladness, and many shall rejoice at his birth. For he shall be, John shall be great in the sight of the Lord, and shall drink neither wine nor strong drink. And he shall be filled with the Holy Ghost, even from his mother's womb. And many of the children of Israel shall he turn to the Lord their God. And he shall go before him in, spirit of, in the spirit of power, in power of Elias, or Elijah, to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the disobedient to the wisdom uh, of the just to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. That was John's job. And guess what John did? He did it excellently. In fact, we read about that in Matthew chapter 3 and verse 1. Matthew 3 and verse 1. And in those days came John the Baptist preaching in the wilderness of Judea and saying, Repent ye, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. For this is he that was spoken of by the prophet Isaiah, saying the voice of one crying in the wilderness, Prepare ye the way of the Lord, make his path straight. And the same John had his raiment of camel's hair, hair and a leather girdle uh, about his loins, and his meat was locusts and wild honey, I told you. Uh, wild honey, by the way. That, that doesn't sound too bad, right? I, think I probably want to try it anyways. Then went out unto him, uh, unto him, uh, out to him, Jerusalem and all of Judea and all the region round about uh, Jordan, and were baptized of him in Jordan, confessing their sins. But when he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees come to his baptism, he said unto them, O generation of vipers, who hath warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Bring forth therefore fruits meet for repentance. 
John did not know anything of, of this sensitive style of preaching, okay? He wasn't worried about offending people. Uh, his was to simply do what God called him to do, to speak truth. And by the way, that is the job of every pastor, not to necessarily worry about feelings as much as worry about truth being Amen. presented. Amen. Amen. And that's what John did. He was no, he was no wimp. He was no uh, pushover. This guy was a man's man. But you know what that man's man did? He said, I'm not here for me. Yeah. I'm here for, for the one who has come to save us all, right? In fact, in John chapter 3, we see an interesting exchange take place. I believe deserves our attention today. One of his disciples had taken offense to the fact that Jesus was now drawing larger crowds than his teacher John was, was uh, drawing. The disciple was loyal to his teacher, and he winced at the thought that someone may be getting more attention than John the Baptist right? Uh, and boy, don't we kind of build our own little clubs like that? Paul had to get on to the church at Corinth because they were doing the very same thing. Some said, hey, I'm a Paul. Others said, I'm a Peter. And then a real spiritual one said, hey, forget you guys. I'm with Jesus, right? And so that's what they were doing, and they were dividing the church. When the truth, truth is, is that we should all be focused on the Lord Jesus Christ, whether it's a pastor, youth pastor, uh, uh, people who, who lead us in singing, our, uh, our, our worship leaders, whoever it is, deacons, we would all agree in this, that our calling is to follow the Lord Jesus Christ Amen. and to point others to him. John got it. He recognized this, right? Granted, while wrong, the response of John's disciple was very human, though. You see, the passage speaks to this fleshly desire of craving recognition, attention, yielding to our pride, desiring our agenda over the Lord's, our kingdom over his, knowingly or unknowingly. However, the most important part of this exchange is again found in John's response to his friend. He could have very easily had said, you know what, you're right. Well, that does kind of rub me the wrong way. And by the way, he's my cousin, and he's younger than me, about six months. He could have said that, right? He was. But he didn't say that. You know what he said instead? Verse 30. He must increase. I must increase. You need to see less of John the Baptist and more of Jesus Christ. Folks, I would submit to you today that that statement is probably one of the most important statements you'll read in all of Scripture. I'm not saying it is the most important, but it is one of the most important statements that we'll find. Because I'm going to tell you what it will do. It will help you lead, 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 there we go, and live an obedient life to Jesus Christ. It will fill your life with purpose. Amen? Yeah. You'll never have as, as a purpose-filled life as when you're living to put Jesus Christ first in it. And more worried and more concerned about do people see Christ in me than do they see what I'm doing? Can they recognize me for who I am and all my accomplishments, right? And so, my friends, today I simply want to challenge you this morning with, a, with two thoughts, really, uh, as we move into this new year, and not even just into the new year. Don't have to wait until next Friday to say, okay, now I'm going to start doing this. Let's do it now, right? But as we get ready to move into this new year, to consider in our own lives, where can we increase Christ? It should be everywhere, right? But where, where is it that God wants to grow in my life? Where should Jesus be seen more in my life? And how do I decrease self? Let's begin with that first point, having more of Christ in this new year. What do we do there? How do we go about that? Increasing Christ. Let's not forget that the order of the universe, really in reality, testifies to the importance of of increasing Christ, to his preeminence in all things, to the fact that he, is, he comes first. It's just this little globe called earth and the people on it that sometimes really get this wrong. We sometimes miss this fact when all of creation uh, cries out that Christ comes first. Do you know what the Pharisees, they didn't like it when Jesus rode in on the donkey on, on uh, Palm Sunday. They hated it. And what they, were, they hated what they were hearing, rather, that people were giving him praise. And do you remember what Jesus told the Pharisees? He said, even if these were to hold their tongue, the rocks and hills would cry out. Why? Because even they recognize the preeminence of Jesus Christ. If people won't, creation will, my friends. John the Baptist reminds us that Jesus is above all. John 3.31, we read about this. He says, he that cometh from above is above all. He that is of the earth is earthly and speaketh of the earth. 
He that cometh from heaven is above all. Jesus wasn't just another great teacher, another great rabbi, a, a great prophet, any of those things, my friends. He was those things, but he was so much more than that. And is so much more than that. He made it very plain and very clear, didn't he? In fact, John said earlier in John 1.29 that Christ is the only one capable of saving mankind. John 1.29 says the next day, John seeth Jesus cometh in, coming unto him and saith, Behold the Lamb of God which taketh away the sin of the world. He didn't pick out some religion and say, There you go, that's the way of salvation. He says, Here's the sacrifice. Here's the Lamb of God, the only one who can take away the sin of our world. Do we know that for a fact, Pastor? Yes, we do. Because Jesus said in John 14, 6, I am the way, the truth, the life. No man comes unto the Father but by me. Now, folks, while Christianity is certainly an inclusive faith, in other words, anybody who recognizes that they are a sinner, doesn't matter what color of skin, doesn't matter your ethnicity, doesn't matter your socioeconomic uh, standing, any of that stuff, doesn't matter any of the, doesn't matter your past, can come to know Jesus as Savior. Amen. And be welcomed in. As, as, a, as, a, as a joint heir with Jesus Christ. It is very exclusive to its claim that Christ is the only way. You don't get there in many different ways, friend. There is only one way, okay? And as sure as I stand here today, I believe that with all my heart, that Jesus Christ is the only way for forgiveness, for new life, and for heaven. John recognized that. Let us not forget as well that the Lord of glory was preeminent. Even we mentioned creation. Paul reminds us of this, that because he created all things, and by his power keeps all things, then he alone deserves first place in our hearts. We don't have the scripture, and that's fine, but it's in Colossians 1. You can read about it later on. Colossians 2 tells us that in him we are complete. We don't have to go looking for something else. That Jesus Christ, uh, we, the relationship we have in him completes us. Totally, perfectly. It's not Jesus plus some other little silly things out here. Really, all we need in this life is Jesus Christ. Amen. Right? Jesus should be preeminent in his calling of those who will serve him. Look at what Paul says in 1 Corinthians 1, 26. As we have that here on the screen. He says, For you see your calling, brethren, how that not many wise men after the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble are called. He doesn't say not any, but he does say not many. So why is that? Because sometimes we get in our own way, right? But God hath chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise. And God hath chosen the weak things of the world to confound the things which are mighty and the base things of the world and the things which are despised. Hath God chosen, yea, and the things which are not to bring to not the things that are, that no flesh should glory in his presence. But of him are ye in Christ Jesus who of God is made unto us wisdom, righteousness, sanctification, and redemption, that according as it is written, he that glorieth, let him glory in the Lord. Even when he calls us into salvation, when he calls us to use us, use us, my friends, he will receive preeminence. In other words, he will come first. Amen? Amen. Not so that we can take the glory for him, from him, absolutely not, but so that the world can look at what God is doing in our life and say, wow, what a mighty God they serve. What a mighty God we serve, right? Even in serving in our calling. Furthermore, let us not forget the pre that his preeminence will be seen and made known as time comes to a close. You've heard me relate to this passage often or quote it. Uh, when every knee will bow and every tongue will confess who he actually is, that he is God. They'll have no way to get around it, my friends. Mm -hmm. They will recognize who Jesus is. Mm -hmm. So creation itself uh, the order of the universe stipulates to us that Jesus comes first, period. But <clears throat> so that's all great, the flowery words, all nice and well, and we all agree with that, but how does that impact my life on a daily basis, right? What do I do with that? I've got just a few ideas that I'd like to share with you this morning, and we'll be quick. But let me begin this with this idea. Of course, we can all increase in our devotion to Christ. We can all increase Jesus in our time of devotion, right? By that I mean this, taking our devotional time more serious. You see, I, honestly, and I'm not trying to knock anybody here, and I'm not saying that you've got to do it X amount of hours a day or X amount of minutes a day. It's not what I'm saying. What I am saying is, is that your time in the Bible ought not to be just at church. Amen? You ought to be able to feed on God's Word throughout the rest of the week. 
You ought to be able to be so in love with Jesus to say that, listen, I, I, I want him to increase in my life, that I want to know what his word says, not just when pastor gets up and preaches it, but when I sit down at the coffee table and open it up, whether that's at work, whether that's at home. I just I want to hear from God. Amen. I want Jesus to talk to me. My devotional life would grow. I like what one man has said about this D.L. Moody, in fact. He said, he reminds us that those who know the Bible best find it ever new. Every time they open up the pages of, of God's Word, they find it new. It's something that's exciting. Let me challenge you to do one of a couple of things this new year. If you've never read through the Bible, maybe don't, don't do it just because I'm telling you to. Pray about it. But maybe take this year as a year to read through the Bible. You say, what's the, is, it, is there a gold star waiting for me? Do we get Kit Kat at the end of the year next year? That's different enough. But what it helps you do is see it in a whole, as a whole. All right, and it's doable. It's very doable. If you read, same as it, uh, three or five chapters. I think just three. Yeah. Three chapters a day, you will you will read through the Bible uh, in a year. It's incredible, and, and it's easier than you think it is. Okay, and if not that, then just say, hey, listen, I'm going to take a book of the Bible, and I'm really going to pour into it, and I want it to pour into me, so that that I hear God speaking to me. Right? I, I know that He's speaking to me, uh, and, and I and my devotional life is is growing there. Someone else has said that a Bible that is falling apart usually belongs to the life of an individual who is not. That's very true. Our devotion, let's increase Christ in our devotion. How about our devotion to Jesus and the decisions that we've made? Moving away from devotional for a second, but let me say it like this. Will our lifestyle in this new year reflect a life guided by the principles of Christ or the mandates of our culture? And the only reason I say that is because it seems like the longer we go and the longer this world spins on, the easier it is for us to move closer to the culture of the world. And I realize we live in the world. I'm not telling us to go out there and be the weirdest people you can possibly imagine, okay? But the culture should not dictate our life and our lifestyle. Amen. God's Word and our relationship with Jesus Christ. Would you agree with me on that? Amen. 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 And as Christians, there are times that we honestly need to take stock of saying, wait a minute, am I living for Lord. Am I honoring? Is my life honoring to the Lord or does it reflect more of the culture around me than it does of Jesus Christ? Something to consider. What about increasing Christ within our homes and our families? What about that? What about spending time in devotion with our children, praying with them, training them to be godly people, and just spending time with them, period, that's needed? I want you to know something, guys, that, that I don't know if there's any other institution out there that has the devil's crosshairs on it like the home. He wants to destroy your home, folks. He wants to crush you. He wants to do whatever he can to, to destroy the relationship that you have with your children, that you have with your spouse, that you have with your parents, your brothers and sisters. If he will, if, if you'll let him, he'll gladly move in and set up camp and destroy whatever he touches in your home. The only thing that stands between your home and utter and complete devastation is the Lord Jesus Christ. And I am here to tell you, my friends, that what God says your home can be, as the Bible tells us, is that he can fill. If you'll build your home on the wisdom and truth of his word, he will, he will take it and he will fill each and every place that he can with his blessing, with precious riches. That's in scripture, all right? He wants to do that. He doesn't want your home being a war zone. He doesn't want there to be constant friction. He wants it to be a place where Christ is honored and exalted. Amen? When you sit down to eat, that he's sitting there with you. The Lord is sitting there with you. When you talk, you rise up to play. When you go to work, when you take the kids to school, that God is that unseen guest constantly there with you. Let's increase Christ in our homes, in our marriages, in our relationship with our children. That may mean picking up the phone today and calling a loved one and saying, you know what, I am sorry for this friction that we've had. Let's put this away. This is not what God would have us to do. Amen? Amen. Seeking forgiveness. That may mean calling grandkids or, or taking the opportunity when they come in to, to visit you for Christmas to take them out for uh, candy or ice cream. Boy, that, that's more that they need, right? They need more of that. Amen. You <laughs> can't have enough sugar. Anyway. <laughs> I was going to pop yesterday. I had so much. But anyways, <laughs> taking them aside and saying, you know, Grandma and Grandpa love you. Little Johnny, little Susie. But we want you to know about the greatest gift that God has given us. And that's a relationship with Him. Amen. Can I talk to you about that? Right? 
and, and not making it some formal thing, not making it this, this huge earth-shattering thing, but thinking in a sweet moment when you talk to your kids, your grandkids, about the Lord Jesus Christ, or even your parents or grandparents. Maybe that's the way it is. Increasing Christ in the new year. What about, and boy, this is a tough one. I should have left this one completely out because it runs all up and down over me. What about increasing Christ in our attitudes? In our attitudes. Nobody in here ever has a problem, right, with your attitude? Amen? <laughs> it's tough, isn't it? What about increasing him in our attitude? In other words, what I mean by that is, is taking stock of the fact that I'm a saved, redeemed individual. Yes, I am very flawed, no pun intended. I, I am very fallible. How about that? Uh, I, I struggle at times, yes. But, but the truth be told is, there ought to be more truth about me being a redeemed person than a sour lemon, right? Or someone that's always negative. And boy, I gotta tell you, I, I'm just being honest with you. You just see me on Sundays, Wednesdays, and, and, and uh, maybe a few days here and there in between. But there are times that I struggle with that negativity. There are times when I, I can run right to that door, and, and, and this is one of my, you pray with me on this, okay? You just forget your attitude issues and just say, Pat, the Lord, pray for pastor today because his attitude stinks. And go ahead. <laughs> I'm kidding. Uh, do pray for me, but pray for yourself too, okay? Uh, and, and one of my things this year is, Lord, help my attitude be less. Help me to see what you're doing and not focus in on the negative and go towards that. Because with the attitude, here's our, here's our next little thought here, speech. How about increasing Christ in, our, in how we talk? Right? Because I promise you this, if the attitude isn't worth squat, the words coming out of the mouth that come from the heart aren't going to be worth it either. Right? Do you know what the Bible says that your attitude or your speech ought to be like? In Colossians, he said, let your speech be always with grace, seasoned with salt, that you may know how you ought to answer every man. In other words, that Christ be manifest even in how I speak. The grace of Christ. Right? Increasing Christ in our attitude. Paul says we ought to have an attitude that's both peaceable, 1 Timothy 2.2, 2, you can look it up later, and joyful. Right? People ought not to run the other way from me when they see me coming into a room. Now, you may Anyways, I had a good friend that used to say, everybody's a blessing, Pastor Wes. He said, some people are a blessing by entering a room. Some people are a blessing by leaving the room. <laughs> Your attitude ought to be such that people just look forward to being around you. Right? It doesn't mean you don't have a bad day here and there. But, but just, hey, listen, I'm, by being around this person, I feel refreshed and encouraged. What about increasing Christ in our workplace? Uh, that's off limits, Pastor. Don't go there. Because I know everybody that has come here today, you absolutely love every minute of every day that you go to work, right? Yes! <laughs> Some of you that are retired are saying, yes, I do, Pastor. Amen. <laughs> Not a second's doubt about it, right? Every day I wake up, I love it. <laughs> well, okay, in the real world, right? <laughs> we, we as people, sometimes even pastors, can, can kind of not look forward to. We, we're not always sitting outside in our cars, jumping up and down and saying, oh, I can't wait to punch the time card today, right? I'm just so looking forward to being at work today and hearing what the boss has to say. I'm sure some, some a measure of, of amount of wisdom is going to pour forth for from his or her mouth to the degree that I am just going to walk out of there going, this is the best day of my life. Anyways, <laughs> what about instead of looking, <laughs> looking at our workplace as just another way of earning some money, making some cash as a missionary opportunity. Because God has you there for a reason. He may not always keep you there, but God has you at that particular place for a reason, for a given amount of time. Who knows how long, right? Some of you are saying, well, I hope it's not much longer. But like it or not, you're a child of God. If you're a child of God, you are there at that spot, and you're going to run into people who are one, maybe backslidden Christians who need a word from the Lord of love and encouragement to let them know it's okay. The walls aren't going to fall in around our church when you come back. We would love to have you. Can I pray for you? Or running around or maybe being around people who are unsaved, who totally don't know Christ as their Savior, and you are the first taste of grace that they're going to get at the workplace. That's right. If we would look at our workplace more as a 
opportunity to share Christ and as an opportunity to reflect Christ maybe and not, not talking about being holier than thou, any of that stuff. No, no, no. I'm just simply talking about letting the grace of God come out of you, if you will, out of your mouth, out of, out of your attitude, out of all of that. So that other people have an opportunity to see Christ. Because you will meet people that I'll never meet, folks, possibly. You'll run across people that maybe I'll never have that opportunity of doing. You'll be that picture of Jesus in their life. Increasing Christ in our workplace. What about increasing Him in our acts of faith? By that I mean this. What area of faith in 2022 are you going to step out in and trust God more? Maybe it's some decision that you were kind of on the fence about last year, but you're not there yet. What are you going to do to step out more and trust Him more? Maybe it's about letting go of something that you're scared to death. If I do this, or if I make this change in my life, I don't know what could happen. How is it going to work out? What about trusting Him more? Because, by the way, we walk by faith and not by sight, right? And so, stepping forward in faith and, and doing that. And then finally, let me add one last thing. What about increasing Christ in our use of spiritual gifts, or how we use them, rather? We realize the reason for spiritual gifts is to build the body of Christ. We're talking about more than just the local church, although that is included. We're talking about bringing people into His kingdom. Amen? Right? But, but using our spiritual gifts as they're meant to be used, as God wants us to, to use them instead of just saying, hey, you know what, I've got some talent, so I'm going to go out here and use that talent for my own purposes, for my own means. But wait a minute. God's the one who blessed you with that gift. God's the one who blessed you with that talent. Use it for His glory. Yeah. Amen. Use it for His glory. Use it for the right reasons. Use it because you love the Lord, not out of compulsion and not because the pastor came and fed you to do it. That happens. Not because you want the attention either, right? Do it because, like John the Baptist did. We talk about a humble guy. He must increase, I must increase. This guy was getting ready to go and lose his head because he was willing to stand up to the king at that time and tell him that what he was doing was not wrong, right? Rather, it was wrong. And so he knew his way out, but I'm going to tell you something, my friends, there was not a greater born among men, or women rather, excuse me, among women than John the Baptist. One day I look forward to getting to meet him in heaven, and he'll be worshiping right alongside of us, amen? Amen. Exciting. But how about using the spiritual gifts that God has given us, increasing Christ in this? Maybe you've never served the Lord, or taken time to put yourself out there to do that, then let me encourage you. Step out this year. Pray about it. Where would God have me? What would God have me to do? Maybe you've been burnt bad. I got it. I've been there too. Maybe it's time to say, listen, what could God use me? Maybe you're at the point, how could God use me in this or that? Maybe you're at a point, physically speaking, that you'd say, Pastor Luke, I can't physically do anything else. I'm at a point in my life where I cannot, you know, I cannot do what I used to do. I'm going to tell you something. You can do the best thing. You can do the best thing. You say, what is that? You can be a prayer warrior. You can lift up the body of Christ. Amen? Amen. It doesn't mean God has shelled you. I need people that are willing to pray. We need people who are willing to pray. God has called us to be prayer warriors. Amen. It's one of the most important aspects, yet most often overlooked aspects of the body of Christ. I know that there are people in this church, if I were to call on you, and I have at times, and say, listen, would you would you pray for this need? Would you lift up this situation? Would you? They'll do it. No question about it. They're praying. It's a wonderful thing. Obviously, the list isn't exhaustive. We could go on and on and on. We won't. There's always more we could add to it. But the point is simple. Increasing Christ affects our life in so many areas. More areas than we can think of. But here's where we find the second point. We'll be quick on this. If we're going to increase Christ, that means that we've got to do something else. We've got to decrease things. We've got to humble ourselves. Someone once said, if I appear to be great in anyone's eyes, the Lord is most gracious in helping me to see how absolutely nothing I am without Him, helping me to keep little in my own eyes. The axe cannot boast of the trees that it is cut down. It could do nothing but for the woodsman. He made it, he sharpened it, he uses it. The moment he throws it aside, it becomes only an old iron. Oh, that I may never lose sight of this. One simple little phrase. 
John the Baptist, one of the greatest prophets to have ever lived, shines a light on man's greatest problem, self. Self. Stories told once again of D.L. Moody. He was asked by an inquisitive Christian, who, sir, of all your flock, gives you the greatest amount of trouble? And don't you know they were waiting with bated breath? <laughs> Brother Bob. <laughs> Sister so-and-so. Yeah, I'll talk to you about them. But you know what? His answer surprised him. It still surprises me. You probably know where I'm going with this. D.L. Moody said, I'll tell you who the individual is that gives me the greatest problems in my flock. You see, he's a man named D.L. Moody. That's who gives me the greatest problems. And really, when I have to think about that, that's very true, isn't it? If I get out of my own way and decrease self, let God do what he wants to do, boy, wow, God can do all kinds of things. Jesus said in Matthew chapter 16, verse 24, he said unto his disciples, If any man will come after me, let him deny himself. That's the hard part, isn't it? Mm. Decrease self. Deny self. Take up his cross and follow me. I've told you this before. It's very hard to carry other things in your hand if you're carrying a cross with you, right? I mean, your hands are kind of full with this cross. But when you think about that, that's the way it's supposed to be. I'm letting go of everything else, Lord, and I'm carrying the cross you've given me to carry. Take up his cross and follow me, for whosoever will save his life shall lose it. And whosoever will lose his life for my sake shall find it. Did you catch that? Whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. True living, my friends, isn't promoting self. It isn't living for my own agenda. It isn't putting my will first. It is saying, thy will be done, O God. Let me promote you. Let me live for you. Every aspect, every breath I take, every pulse that goes through my body, let it be for you, Lord Jesus. The Apostle Paul gives us another step that we take. Galatians 2, chapter 2, verse 20. Would you look this up? While you're looking that up, Galatians 2, 20. F.B. Meyer once said, We cannot hope to increase Christ if we're not first willing to decrease self. Paul said, here's how I tackle this issue. He said, I am crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live. In other words, he didn't physically die. Yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. <laughs> Paul said, the moment I got saved on that road to Damascus, at whatever point he really placed his trust in the Lord Jesus, he said, Paul ceased to exist for Saul. I'll be accurate about it, okay? Saul stopped living. And that body that walked around that looked like Saul or Paul, well, really, that was Jesus living in that body. Amen. And that's the way he saw it. That's the way he lived life. You think about that. It's not, a, it's not this, this huge, deep thought here. It's just truth. He said, listen, I died. That old life died. It's done. It's gone. It's in the grave. There's a new person walking around. And it's Jesus Christ in me. Right? It's him living out his life in me. And that's the way he saw things. And by the way, because he saw that, consider this, if you will. That man, he no longer lived. He no longer had to worry about uh, things that might hurt him. He no longer had an ego to worry about because that's, that's gone. That's done. Right? Or his pride being stepped on. He no longer had to worry if someone had offended him. No longer had to worry about how he was going to eat at night, right? Because this is the Lord's deal. He's taking care of this, right? He's the one living in my life now. I'm just, I'm dead. I'm gone, right? He's taking control over this vessel. You think about the implications of such a statement that says, I am crucified with Christ. I am crucified with Christ. And I go back to myself, and I have to ask myself, do I live my life in that manner? Mm. I'm glad you're not with me 24-7. <laughs> but the answer would be no, not always. But the answer is yes, I need to. Every day, every minute. Less of Wes. Less of Brother Wes. More of Jesus Christ. Right? As we stand with our heads bowed and our eyes closed this morning, can any of us here today, myself included, really argue the fact 
that we all need to be more Christ-centered and less self-focused, self-centered in life. But you know, years ago, I believe back around 100 AD, there was a model of, um, of how the universe rotated, how it spun. And the way it was presented and believed by most Roman astrologers, astronomers, excuse me, was that the solar system was Earth-centric. In other words, everything rotated around the Earth. And I believe it was years around 1500 uh, A.D. when um, Copernicus first published his first work challenging that thought. That the universe doesn't rotate around the Earth. Later on, Galileo, the first telescope, could tell that that's not the case. The universe actually rotates around the sun, right? Now think about that, and you say, well, that's great, thanks. <laughs> that does nothing for me. But the truth be told, you'll think about it, my friends, how my, many of us today, myself included, we live our life as the center of our own little universe. When in reality, the truth is, Christ is the center of all things. And the quicker we figure this out, the better off we are. He must increase. I must decrease. Less of me, more of him. How about you today? Your head bowed, your eyes closed. You said, Pastor West, listen, don't embarrass me. And I won't. I have to embarrass myself too. I will pray for you. You said, Pastor, pray for me. I need to increase Christ. Honestly, there's been too little of him and too much of me. I don't want that. He doesn't want that. Would you pray for me in this? As we enter into this new world, I'm happy to drive through this new year. More of Jesus. Less of me. Maybe in your home, your workplace, your attitude, where? Be glad to. Is it you? Would you slip your hand up today? Thank you, Father. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. If you're here this morning and say, Pastor Wes, look, I've never even taken that first step of salvation. I I don't understand what you're talking about here. Well, friend, it starts right there at salvation, recognizing that you are not the center of the universe. That everybody has their end on this earth. One day that time will come. When we leave this place, what will matter then in that moment of time is what we did with Jesus Christ on this earth. Whether he was the center of our universe or it was us. And I'm going to tell you how serious a consequence that is. It's heaven and hell. It's that different. It's the difference between heaven and hell. It's the difference between a forgiven life and a life that's just like everyone else, if you will. A redeemed life or an unredeemed life. If you're here today and you don't know Christ as your Savior, can I invite you to come here in a minute and let us take a Bible and show you how you can have new life in him purpose, a purpose-filled life in Jesus today. Would you do that? Father, we bow before you humbly. God, I thank you for the, just the honesty and the humility of these folks that raised their hands, Lord, the courage it took to do that. Lord, the recognition in their own life, Father, that they know that there's times that we all struggle, Father, and it's not just them, it's all of us, it's me too. I put myself at the center of my own little universe. God, that's not pleasing to you. It's not honoring to you. And it's certainly not deserving of the gift your son has given us. Lord, I'm asking that you would move in this place today. Speak to hearts and minds. Help us, God. Lord, to set more of ourselves behind us. Increase Christ. Just as John the Baptist recognized. Just as he admitted to Please bless this time. If there's one here today that does not know your son is their Savior, please, Father, work in their heart. Help them to see how much they need him, truly need him. Lord, we love you. We thank you. Bless now this time. In Jesus' name.